So as I said, this is a, an online training session from the IHR Centre for the History of People, Place and Community. Uh, we, our aims are to explore placed history, the history of place from um, the parish to the metropolis, thinking across regions and locations. We're home to projects like the digital crowdsourced public history project Layers of London and also to the Victoria County History of England, last year celebrating its 120th anniversary. The VCH, for those of you who are not familiar with the project, aims to complete authoritative histories of every county in England from the very earliest times to the present day. We've got 17 counties currently active across England. All kinds of people are involved with the VCH, from professional historians to increasingly volunteers who power and drive the project. We're hoping that these online training sessions will be of interest to anyone working on local history or interested in the history of place. And we think they'll be particularly of use to anyone involved in the VCH project as well. In fact, we asked our VCH community what kinds of topics would be useful for these training sessions. And that's how we've put the programme together. This is the first in our initial programme of online training sessions. You'll find full details on our Centre for the History of People, Place and Community website. They are now, I think, all fully booked, but they will all be available in our events archive for you to catch up with or watch again later. And we are planning to deliver more of these online training sessions. So please do get in touch if there are areas you'd really like us to cover, areas that would be valuable in your work, whatever kind of local history you do, or whatever kinds of project you're involved in. If you're that way inclined, please feel free to tweet and share this event on social media. You can use the hashtag for our centre at chppc underscore IHR. So all that remains for me to do now is to thank everyone who's been involved in putting these sessions together, to thank our speakers and to thank all of you for coming. I'd also particularly like to thank my colleague Adam Chapman, who's organised these sessions um, with my colleague Matt Bristow and the IHR team. We're really grateful, um, Adam, and I'm really looking forward to today's event. So I'll hand over to you now, Adam. Thanks. OK, thank you, Catherine. That's, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so today's session, um, as Catherine said, is the first of four in this tranche, well, this first tranche. We hope there'll be several, at least one more and several more after that um, of CHPP, uh, yeah, Centre of the History, Place and Community, People, Place and Community um, training sessions into elements of local history, which are sort of tailored to our VCH audience to a certain extent, but also hopefully of wider interest. And today we begin with mapping and cartography. So there'll be two speakers um, today. Well, first will be me um, talking about how we, the VCH, put together maps, the kind of maps we use and the different ways in which we use them. And also, um, and how we might advise a group, particularly volunteers, um, who are putting together a history of a place Let's call it Ambridge. Let's imagine that it is indeed that village best known for the Radio Falls, the Arches. Um, and if you like, if, you, if it would help, you can voice up the emails you're not reading. And my responses are to Linda Snell and Jennifer Aldridge, who are doubtless uh, at, each other, at each other's throats like cats in a sack, is the way these authors are. Um, but and the second speaker, I'm um, very pleased to welcome uh, Stuart Brooks from UCL. Um, who will be talking about the uses of mapping in for research, particularly digital mapping and the different ways in which you can use that. And hopefully you'll find that really interesting and really exciting. I've had a quick uh, peek at his presentation, which he sent in advance, and it looks fabulous. So I'm slightly concerned that mine doesn't look nearly as good. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the idea is that I will talk for about 40, 40, 45 minutes, then Stuart will talk for about the same amount of time. We should be done by around about half past three, in which time there'll be time for questions, um, which, um, which and any questions occur to you in the course of this, please put them in the chat box so we can have a look at them and see what sort of general things are coming out. Anyway, so if I can remember how to share the screen, let us do, let us begin. Come on, uh, from the beginning. Scrolling. Okay, so today's session is very much a look at what mapping can do more than just illustrate local history and to frame what is being studied. 
So just to point out, this draws on the collective experience of the VCH team. That's uh, myself, Matt Bristow and Jessica Davis-Porter, um, especially our architectural and plan, uh, editor and um, managing editor. Um, all of whom we have been responsible for putting together um, most of the VCH uh, texts and maps for the last few years. And so we'll be looking at some practical considerations. First is what do you want a map to show? What should it include? And what should it actually ignore? The whole, the whole point of including maps in your publications is that you should be able to, it's an editorial process, you should be able to, able to uh, include some things and not include others depending on what you're trying to get the map to do. So sometimes it will be appropriate to use a map that already exists and sometimes you'll need to get one drawn for you or to draw your own. So we'll be examining this through um, what's an imagined Ambridge Local History Society um, might want to do to show or update the history of their village. Um, so for those of you who don't know Ambridge, it is the setting for BBC Radio 4's long running and for our purposes, slightly helpfully, poorly geographically defined um, country soap opera set in the county of Borsetshire, um, which is somewhere in the English Midlands. Probably best to think of it as Worcestershire, I guess. Um, so I was discussing this as we might approach the subject. Um, so the authors, the likes of Jennifer Aldridge and Linda Snell, might well do things differently. And it's worth pointing out that we're not treading new ground here. Uh, there has been a local history of Ambridge. You can see a picture of the cover on the slide um, called Ambridge, an English village through the ages uh, by Jennifer Aldridge and John Tregoran with the almost silent help of the former Oxfordshire archivist, James Bond. Um, and it's published in 1981, which may or may not be a a coded introduction to English local history through the lens of a village in the English Midlands and it's heavily informed by the work of uh, W.G. Hoskins, the likes of Christopher Taylor and the Royal Commission into the Ancient Historical Monuments of England, uh, as well as Bond's own quite extensive work as a landscape historian and archivist. So um, we're working on the principle that uh, you can't produce a meaningful local history without a map. Um, not every local historian, it has to be said, would agree with that. Um, as this uh, excerpt from HPR Fenberg's uh, interesting article, How Not to Write Local History, um, reminds us. Um, so you may recognise from this features of local histories which you may have which you may have read over the years. So if you do, so the point is what we're trying to do in the VCH, and hopefully you will be doing as well, is to provide something that looks good, looks professional, looks informative, and should and the standards of academic rigour we apply to our text, you should also be applying to your maps. Um, so in general, worth reflecting on maps as a tool in historical study first. So on the whole, maps are the great assistance of the social military and general historians, it says here. Um, they provide illustrations otherwise unobtainable and they bear out descriptions of events and places which occur in contemporary writing. So the point is that a map is both an illustration of what you're saying in the text, but it's also an amplification and a way of doing things which text cannot do so readily. Um, you can't play, you know, if you're talking about the village pound, the village church, the village green, a common, common land or open fields, you can't describe those relative to one another without sooner or later having to put it on the, put it on the page as a map. Um, so the first thing to bear in mind is not that, um, is what, a map, what we are trying to do with a map in our works of local history, which is not to do what the Ordnance Survey do, it's not to survey and record um, what is there or what has been lost, um, but it's to illustrate those things. Um, so we're interested in showing the reader what landscape and settlement as a place as it was and how that has been, how that's changed and been shaped. So what we generally do in the VCH is to take our maps and base them on something else that is all, so with the aid of a freelance cartographer. However, a good brief is really important and a clear, and for that you need to have a clear understanding of what is wanted and how many maps you need and how, what they should include. So, for Ambridge, what we're imagining is that, is that the local history com community in the village want to update their text and change it and make it into something which we recognise as a VCH short. Um, these are these little small, handsome, handsome little paperbacks um, about 30,000 words. Um, we've published a great number. The most recent I've illustrated in the slides, which is Coal Wall in Herefordshire, 
a, a fine painting by Dame Laura Knight on the cover. Um, so, for our purposes, what is available? To, what sorts of maps are available for local historian? Um, Stuart will be touching a little bit on this and his presentation in a bit after mine, so I won't go into too much detail. But fundamentally, the maps that are most useful to us are estate maps, county maps, um, tithe maps, and enclosure awards, things like railway and canal maps, which are made in the course of construction of those of those of those uh, topographical features. Maps were created by the Ordnance Survey and things like agriculture and land use maps, which reflect the way in which land was used, usually in the 20th century. So first of the first and the oldest generally of these are estate maps, um, which give a sense of which were commissioned by landlords um, to give us an idea of an extent of their lands and estates for a variety of purposes. Sometimes it's just to sort of delineate what they've got and the use to which that land is being put at a particular point in time. Um, this is often accompanied by development of changes or an increase of estate. If, if someone has inherited a lot of land, they want to know exactly what they've got and what it looks like. Um, these are of mixed quality, it has to be said, and are probably from our point of view, best, you, best serve us best as illustrations of what the landscape was like and how it was used at a given point in time. Um, but also they make very good illustrations, particularly if you have the budget to do things in colour. Um, downside, from our point of view, as we're writing parish histories, they very seldom include whole, the whole parish. They just have bits of, they have the bits of land belonging to one person. If you're very lucky, they might have the names of the neighbouring landowners. Um, they may, of course, have lands in more than one parish, which is helpful in one respect, but limits their utility for us. Um, they all, as, as I said, they make good illustrations, and as used, we've used one on the cover of our recent short, Wem in Shropshire. Um, the other downside to these things is their state of preservation. Um, this is a map um, of several small estates in Little Clapton in Essex, um, held at the National Archives as part of a set of Chancery Masters exhibits. Um, these, they, they've been in part of the Chancery records uh, for one of those Jarndyce v Jarndyce sorts of cases which were strung out over about 50 years, um, which is one of the reasons for the state of the map. Um, and the land is now in the hands of the Greenwich Hospital charity. Um, the, reason the, um, the reason the Chancery case was to challenge the, um, the will of the man who left it to the pre precursor of that charity. Um, so these maps are very useful and they give us in indication of different uh, things like field names, the names of uh, tenants and, and, and landowners, um, acreages, um, size of fields. All these fields incidentally are actually visible in the landscape today because of the charitable land ownership. They've been, they've been excluded from the enclosure of the rest of the parish. Um, but the reason it's in the state it is, is because the map had been in Chancery for so long it got traced. And how you trace a large manuscript map of this sort is to lay it down on a fresh sheet of linen or parchment and to prick through it with a pointer. Um, like, and the net effect is like a book of stamps, if you remember them. And um, bits for, and the ink being the ink, these maps were drawn with somewhat acidic, and the net result is that little bits fall out over the years. And this was what confronted me when I went to the archive, went to the National Archives, and a little bit of a house and field fell out in front of me. And I had to go rather shamefaced to the, map, the, uh, the duty the duty archivist in the map room and say, I think this needs conserving, which it has been. Um, one of the risks of these things is they may not have the an archive may not have the budget to conserve, but this one has been. So I'm happy to show it you now. Um, so while they have their uses, they also have the limitations. Um, obviously, this does not show the whole parish; it only shows a portion of it. And while that can sort of inform accounts of land ownership. It's not much good as anything except a source. Um, other things which we also use for illustrations, but all, which provide details of things like coach roads, turnpikes, the routes taken, and what people thought were important. And usually in the, eight, in the eight, usually in the 18th century, uh, the county series of maps, um, and most counties, I think all counties actually have one. So there's one, have one for Herefordshire here, and we have an excerpt from uh, a map of um, Wiltshire, which is Codford St Peter, um, which gives you a sense of how big the how big the settlement in the parish was at that time, where the parish boundaries lay, 
and you find analogies to these all over the country from Faden's map of Norfolk for example which is 1760s I think um, through to um, Ch uh, Chapman's map of uh, Essex uh, in about in about 10 years later um, uh, so what we also, the other thing other things we use are tithe and enclosure awards um, tithe maps were created in the 1830s and 40s um, as a as um, a, a way of um, establishing what tithe was owed to um, uh, the clergy and to um, commute that into cash. So to make, the purpose of this was to make uh, clerical incomes more predictable and based on a sort of standardised basis. But what they also record is the state of the landscape before the agricultural revolutions of the second half of the 19th century. Um, now, the, the, the beauty of these is an awful lot of them are available digitally. Um, all of Wales is covered, for example, and we'll come to some of that later. Um, mo and most of the safe west of England and many other counties are gradually digitising their tithe maps in a way that makes them more generally accessible, which is brilliant. Um, and they include everything from every plot of land is named, numbered and detailed. Water is always recorded in some detail on this because water itself is not tidable. Um, so it is deducted from the acreage of the parish to make sure that everyone that you get a fair dose. Things that are on the water might be tidable, however, so ducks, for example. Um, but um, that is one of their uses. Um, maps for the construction of railways and canals are also particularly interesting, particularly useful because they give you a sense of original the, the date and original routes of interruptions to the landscape. In this case, the Bridgewater Canal. Um, but you also find uh, every railway has been a, every railway, every canal will be will be surveyed, and the landscape it cuts through, and augments and changes will be described in the documents record, recording the land you, uh, the land that was taken to create those those uh, bits of infrastructure. Uh, you can sometimes see these on um, very early railways, for example, often appear on the tide map. So the Great Western Railway. Um, built opened in 1840 is recorded on most of the tide maps along the route of it from uh, London to Bristol. Um, down the road from me, the village of Lye, which is uh, in Kent, um, has the embankment for the railway built in 1836 record, recorded on the map um, without a railway on it, although the next door parish does have the railway on the map because it's a little bit later. So you get a sense of when things happen in the landscape as well. It's, you know, make they, these paint a picture of the landscape as a, as a dynamic and changing thing, um, which is again useful for writing our histories, but also for illustrating them potentially. Um, here's, an, here, here's an example of a railway map, um, which you'll notice gives a number of fields which the railway cuts through. Um, town of Blinkensop, which I think is Lancashire. Um, so moving on to maps you actually have heard, you'll all hopefully all be familiar with and will have all have heard of, which are those created by the Ordnance Survey, which as you should probably know was established in 1791. And between 1791 and 1840, much of England and Wales, but not all of it, was surveyed and maps published at a scale of one inch to the mile, which is quite tiny, but their early, their relatively early date is very helpful. Um, 1854, a standard scale of survey of 25 inches to the mile, or one to two and a half thousand, then she's the rural areas of Britain, and by 1896, all of Britain had been surveyed, some of it twice. Um, and these are fantastically forensically detailed map, which, maps, which give um, position of every tree, every lane, every footpath, every hedge, every field boundary. And they are, as such, one of the key things, one of our key sources, but also one of the things we base our maps on. Um, so, but it's worth bearing in mind that just because they were surveyed at 25 inches to the mile doesn't mean they were published at 25, or published at 25 inches to the mile. Um, so you could get other scales, six inches to the mile, which is the one to 10,560, 10, 10, as well as the larger full detailed survey. And from 1891, a general revision of both scales was undertaken and was completed by 1914. And of course, revisions have gone on ever since. Um, and these have the advantage that um, the metadata is available to download. The various versions of the early maps are available to download, are available to use in lots of different places. Um, the best, probably the best known is the National Library of Scotland, which of course have the advantage of being free, 
if you've got an if you've got a um, university login and university affiliation, what you can do is to access Adena Digimap, um, which has all the same things, which has all the maps available, but hasn't georectified, so they overlay on top of each other, and you can track change in the landscape through time through the different editions of the Ordnance Survey, uh, which is fantastically useful and really. And again, gives that sense of dynamic, a dynamic landscape, and particularly useful for the development of towns <clears throat> and villages, the introduction of bypasses, railways, main roads, the change, you know, the changes of land use, of industry, all sorts of things which are otherwise quite difficult to track in a physical sense. Um, in a way, and you can identify where things actually exist, where things happen to be. Um, the four maps we have in the corner of this slide are Ledbury and Herefordshire, and you get a sense of how the, how the mapping changed as well, and as well as the changing spread of the town around the crossroads in the centre and the development of it as a settlement. Um, particularly, also particularly useful are uh, agriculture and land use maps, and these come in various forms. Um, obviously, tide maps fall into this category in some respect, um, because they give you a, an account of what land was used for at the time of the tithe survey and what tithe was due on that and how that was worked out financially. Um, so that gives the other advantage of that is it gives you a view of what pre-modern farming was like. Um, so you could still get the remnants of open fields perhaps, you get um, before mechanised farming really took off. Um, later um, Surveys included the Lloyd George Doomsday of 1911, which is a property evaluation survey, which gives you descriptions of buildings in the accompanying notes, as, which you can then compare with maps and you can work out what building is what and what it was used for, which is particularly useful given the rapid, rapid changes in agriculture um, in, the 19, in the 20th century and now into the 21st century. Things change at an alarming rate and this gives you a basis from which to work. So in the ways in which mapping can be used is to augment other sources and to place them in a sort of place their place their content in a physical context uh, is in their physical surroundings. So um, yes, so agricultural maps. The other um, there are surveys of land use made as well in the 1930s, but the other one which is particularly useful um, are, the uh, are those maps that accompany the 1941 farm survey um, held at National Archives. Um, the survey documents themselves under the call the heading MAF 32, and I think the map the accompanying maps are I think MAF 67, um, uh, which is, which provide you with the idea of the scope of farms, but also gives you an account of the state of the buildings, the, comp the capacity and quality of the farmers. All farmers were ranked whether they were any good, whether they were really good, a whether they were doing okay, b and the reasons for that, and c could do better. Um, and if they were irredeemable, which some were reckoned to be, the land was confiscated from them. So that gives you a set. And in there, you find a report of whether they had running water, whether they had um, power, whether they had machinery, um, but also the state of the farm buildings themselves. So then you can, you can from, from the survey data, you can tra transpose that onto the maps. And these are a fantastic resource, which is to be better known and better used. Um, and here, in fact, is one of the examples of those um, farm survey maps, which give you an extent of a small farm, um, somewhere on the edge of Exmoor, I think. Yeah, it's Hawkridge. Um, the more general surveys, which um, um, published in the 1930s, um, gives you land use coded by colour. So you can see the, and the different ways in which topography shaped farming, which is fantastically useful in getting a wider sense of what was going on in a landscape and then you're able to compare it with what you can see today. Um, but again, these are of limited, these are of use for our text, but not the kind of thing we use to base our research on. So when thinking about how we would use a map um, in our text to complement our text, you have to think, well, what are we trying to achieve with a map and what can a map show us? Um, so this example is um, West Mill Parish and Parish in Hertfordshire, which is on the which is near the Cambridgeshire border. Um, and one of the things we can do with it is to you, is to look at features which dictate the course of parish boundaries. So in this case, um, you can see at the top of the map um, the irregular squared off lines um, which indicate the enclosure of an open field and the arbitrary delineation of parish, uh, one parish from another. 
through what were presumably originally shared open fields. Um, in the south, in the southeast corner, the parish boundary has been realigned with the railway line. Um, in, a, in another plot, well, there's a Roman road goes through the middle of it. Um, so our regular or modern routes, um, including that Roman road, um, or arbitrary lines which cut through natural and man-made features which could indicate ancient features now lost. Um, so as a rule of thumb, if you see a Roman road going over the top of field boundaries which um, look to be cut through by that road, those boundaries are probably truly ancient. Um, you might see that with motorway as well, but um, so you can see the elements of religious life in the landscape. So the farm is called Grange Farm, for example, it may belong to a monastic institution, um, as in Ambridge. Um, you can see where the church is, you can see where the glebe lands are potentially. You can see where the village is located within its landscape relative to its open fields, whether it's a small, whether it's a nucleated, i.e. A, you know, a small village held together in, in, it, in the landscape, or whether it's a dispersed settlement of cottages dotted about and farms all over the landscape. You can see the nature of agriculture and woodland and closed open field systems. Um, this is more sort of delving into research sort of realms really, but these are the kind of things you might want to show on a map you have drawn. It also shows things like transport and communication networks, so the railway, the roads, the rivers, canals, um, routes, to, and where these roads and railways and canals go. Um, this is not something the Ordnance Survey generally gives you, except the very age of sheets. So for our maps, we would want to include that. If the road goes to, say, Bishop Stortford or to Cambridge, then we'd say give that as in our direction. The railway went to, say, Basingstoke. Um, it's important to note that Basingstoke is in one direction rather than the other. So just to sort of sh shape what is being displayed, what is being shown in the reader's mind, when, what can they, where they can expect to see this place sit. Um, you can also see cities and towns provide you with different challenges and different sorts of um, things to show. So in the case of Leicester, for example, you can see the infilling of the historic marketplaces. You can see the development and impact of uh, transport infrastructure, so the railway cutting through the western half of the map, development of industry alongside it, um, evidence of planned layout of various different periods around the historic centre of the town, the city, you can see things like medieval burgage plots, those long thin plots that run perpendicular to the high street, you can see industrial suburbs built on square grids, on survey maps also provide street name of the evidence um, for early features, and you can see how a historic urban layout it fits within a modern town plan. And these are the kind of things we can show in no other way, really. You can describe where the delineation is, but that only works if someone knows the place that's being described. Ultimately, you need a map. So you can also see things like administrative boundaries and religious and military features, so castles, churches, chapels, um, burial plots of different denominations. All these things are include all, the, all these things sort of are arranged relative to a settlement and can be shown through cartography. And you can show this also through different maps doing different things at different times. So here you have a small settlement, a small a small village of North, in Northamptonshire called Corby, surrounded by open, it's enclosed open fields and trees and woodland and a railway running through it. Later on. It's bigger, and then in the in, uh, in the twentieth century, someone plants a steelworks in the middle of it, it digs the open fields out for ironstone, and it and, and expands the town hugely um, to its current to its current extent. And of course, you can also see the industry vanish. Maps are not also about, and um, all maps are ways really of presenting spatial data. They are telling you about how things fit into a given space. Now they're not, they need not be surveys of the sort we're familiar with from the Ordnance Survey, but they can be like this, um, ways of presenting how many houses are on a street, roughly what they look like, how tall they are relative to one another. Um, is diff these are presenting different bits of information. Um, and again, this is a useful historical tool. Um, from this you can describe you know, the development and changes in occupation, you can get some sense of which buildings shown at a particular point might still be there today. Um, what they and you can see that you can see their usages and their lab, and labels, so where different bits of industry, fish market, um, bakeries, um, market stalls and, and 
uh, the use of different use of different bits of the high street. This is so. This is a landscape. This is a townscape as a lived experience as well as a surveyed entity. Of course, the most famous example of this is um, the London Underground map, which presents things almost independent of topography. You know, the idea is to make it easy to get from one point of the system to another point of the system, and not necessarily to regard that as a geographical entity in itself. Um, so if you look at if you look at um, embankment. Um, you don't you, know, you don't really get a sense that it's a two minute walk from embankment to Charing Cross, which of course it is. Um, or indeed, monument is the monument is the same station as bank, but it actually takes you rather longer to walk from one side to the other. Um, the idea is to show different spots on a route, or the Heathrow Terminal Four, for example, will take you a good forty minutes on the Piccadilly Line to reach um, from central London. That's not its purpose. The purpose is to show points relative to others, and of course. You don't have to just simply use um, traditionally surveyed maps or, so, or indeed, um, Stuart will talk more about this later, but geographical information systems are ways of presenting spatial data uh, relative to one another. So it might be topographical data, it might be the ways in which different lands landscape features interact, it might be the way you, and you can add and, dis add and subtract those features as you wish. Um, probably the most easily accessible visualization of this is DEFRA's magic map, which you haven't come across, is a fantastic tool for understanding how administrative geographies work. So where parish boundaries are, where local authority boundaries are, sites of special scientific interest, listed buildings, scheduled ancient monuments, these are all integrated within the same map and you can turn layers off and on with different sorts on an ordnance survey base map, you have it in black and white or in colour, and it is a fantastically useful way of understanding how the state views the landscape, but also a way of understanding how different features interact with one another. More sophisticated still, and um, Layers of London, um, which is another centre of history, people, place and community project. Uh, it's a very good example of this. Um, it takes different it takes maps and photographs of different areas of London and overlays them one another so that you can compare one to the other. Um, and if you haven't looked at that, do take a look at it. It's a fantastic resource. Um, if you live in anywhere within Greater London, so anywhere in the 35 boroughs that currently constitute the capital city. Which takes us back to Ambridge, which being a fictional community, doesn't have um, a huge amount of uh, spatial georeference or GIS or spatial data but does have maps. There are a great many maps produced at Ambridge of various different types trying to do various different things. This one, I would suggest, is trying to do too much. It's incredibly detailed, but it would only work if you were to print it. It doesn't work on this screen. It probably won't work on yours. Um, you need to produce it probably with the A3 or split. From a production point of view, you need to split, you need to split it across two pages and, to, and that would produce discontinuities for the reader, which may or not, and it includes too much detail. So, if you were to draw a map to publication, what are you trying to do? I mean, the first question I would ask you is, do you actually need to draw a map at all? Can you, will, a, will an existing map provide you the information you want? Um, the most obvious example, I suppose, would be a tide map or an on survey map. And if you, so, if you do need to draw a map, how many maps do you need? Now for a single parish, that, that's the question, you might just want a map showing the whole parish, you might want a map just showing the village, you might want a map that shows both. Um, but that's, a question, that's the third question, what do you want a map to show and how will you create it? In other words, who will you get to do it and what will they base it on? And now I'm going to explore a few examples of how that might work and how we've done it. Um, I asked uh, our managing editor, Jess Davis Porter, what she thought and what she thought the key things for anyone commissioning a map need to know were. Um, and she boiled this down to three, which is one, think about how it will look on the page. So if you're producing one of our red books, which is uh, around a, roughly A4, it's not, it's a little bit smaller, um, or, or a short, which is approximately A5, you're going to be able to fit different things and different levels of information onto the map and onto the page. Is your map going to be legible? So the labels need to be a size you can actually read. If there's too much information on your map, can, can you use insets? I.e., if there's a large area, if your parish is a sort of funny triangular shape, you've got a, a whole space in the bottom corner you could do things with, and you could show a larger scale map 
of the village. Um, does it need to be two maps? Does it, I, is the village sufficiently complicated that you want to show it in a separate map in more detail? Think what the reader needs to know. I think what you're trying to tell the reader and how that can amplify what you've got in your text. Second point, which is a production point, which is plan ahead. Allow time for proofreading and bear in mind that you'll nearly always spot something once you've seen the maps typeset with the text. So your cartographer, whoever he or she is, probably will not be familiar with the place being described and will just spell things as they see fit, for example. So you need to check that. You want to check that the railway doesn't, the, a railway map doesn't point to, say, um, Tavistock in both directions. It does sometimes happen on the railway, um, but not always and quite unusually it will be confusing. Finally, and you're amazed how many two people don't include these on draft maps, include keys and scales. What do you want each symbol to show and how big is the area being described? Come on. Right. The other thing to bear in mind is what your publisher wants. Read the manual. Does your publisher have a style sheet? We do. We will send it out to authors if required. And here is an excerpt from it, um, which gives our standard mapping conventions. Um, most publishers, many, well, I don't know, most publishers will have something like this. And will have a, have a cartographer they suggest, they might recommend or suggest you use. Do take their suggestion seriously. Um, but you don't have to, you, you know, or if you know someone who can, is a cartographer um, or is a, you know, a good professional illustrator um, whose work you've seen and understand and rate, then that might be an option for you. Um, to give you a sense of how, how these things, how detailed these things are, this is an example um, map which gives you a sense of what we, what we mean by different phrases, how we, you, how we frame different things, what things are allowed, in the VCH, we have a convention where you don't, have to, you shouldn't have to turn the book to read the map properly. So think about that too. Um, so to do this, of course, it's vital to choose your base map accurately. And there are different ways you can do this. The old fashioned way was to get some tracing film out and just to put it on top of another map and to draw in what you wanted to show. Um, alternatively, you can do what this, this author has done, which is to mark up an existing ordnance survey map in pink highlighter, which they and they've highlighted the bits they want to show on their eventual map, outlining um, the area that they're studying. I mean, there's going to be differences approach with um, um, if you're trying to show multiple parishes, as we would in the introduction to a red book, or if you're just trying to show one in detail or a village in detail. Um, you could, if if an estate takes over, it takes up an entire village, entire parish. Um, using a state map as a base. This one is a particular, this is a particularly good earlier state map uh, from Boxworth in Cambridgeshire, which includes the entire parish. And if you look at closely at the uh, enlargement, shows you the direction of Ridgeon Furrow farmland. It shows you different bits of land use, every lane, every field, and it's incredibly detailed and would make actually a perfectly reasonable basis for a later map or for the information you want to include on the map you in want to. Want on the map you actually want to publish that isn't included on um, on the survey map because the, the landscape had changed by the time the map was made. So um, perhaps the earliest maps you could use successfully would be um, the tide maps. And uh, here is an example from Somerset, which is a which is a this is North Parish. This is a tiny parish of North Barrow, which had a population of about 150 since the 11th century. Um, which um, this type map is um, reproduced from uh, Know Your Place West, which is a, um, a, collaborative a collaborative exercise from various local authorities in the southwest, which has scanned and reproduced all the tide maps um, from, from Somerset, Devon, uh, Gloucester, Wiltshire, and I think Dorset, no, not Dorset, um, and the area of Bristol. Um, so, what we've what the Somerset series do is use the tide maps as a basic, um, they reproduce everything consistent scale uh, traced off the tide maps. So what you get is this. So what we've done here is to include the layout, is to greatly simplify the field boundaries and show land use instead. Um, and to give you the names of the principal fields which reflect um, the open fields that used to exist in the parish, give you the name of the river and give you the layout of orchards surrounding um, 
um, surrounding the village. It's a perfectly typical um, landscape of the south, uh, this particular part of South Somerset. Um, a slightly more sophisticated approach, um, exemplified here by a map, uh, a map trying to show Bishop's Soil Common, which is an obviously now been long, long since enclosed, an area of land enclosed by the bishops of Durham in the 12th century, is to give a sense of what was there and based on later mapping, showing boundaries which we know existed. So this one has been traced in a uh, um, very, very unsophisticated way, but it works very well, which is to take a power, which is to take, put the two, put what you want on PowerPoint and to trace over it and colour it in. Um, and this um, gives you different things you want to highlight. Um, in this case, uh, gates onto the common, settlements within the common, and this was used to brief the cartographer, showing the principal watercourse, the principal lanes and routes through the landscape. So it's a process of simplification rather than anything else. So finally, if commission, so in, if I was to give advice um, to Linda and Jennifer, what I would suggest, what I would say to them is decide in advance what you want to show on your map, check what your publisher wants, look at their style sheet, think of the reader and how the publication will look. It's really important, really vital to understand what the, re what the person who opens the book or looks on the website or whatever it is, will actually see and what, you know, and what they should take away from that, the first impressions. Don't try to do too much of one map. And remember the map must work with the text and should be read alongside it at the editorial phase of the book. And shouldn't assume knowledge, knowledge on the part of the reader. So do include your scales, do include what the symbols mean, don't assume that they, they know what you know. Um, oops, what I meant to do. Um, and here are some links of maps so that you can actually get hold of. Um, there's a very good subject guide from the National Archives website, National Library of Scotland, which I mentioned before, Welsh Tithe maps, which include the entire country and also the awards, which give you all the additional information. Know Your Place West, which I referred to. Um, Norfolk have a very good historic map uh, engine, which has everything from tithe and enclosure maps to Ordnance Survey and Aerial Photographs of various periods, Layers of London, and again, Vision of Britain, which has a, based on the um, research of uh, Roger Kane and, um, uh, what's the first name, Oliver, um, which has a parish by parish breakdown and maps that with institutional uh, data. Um, after there, I will leave it and hand over to Stuart. Thank you. I am here, just to say. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> Saw you there. Uh, I'm going to have the same problem as you just had um, with sharing your screen. Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. okay. <laughs> Multiple screen issues. Right. Can you see that? Yeah. Is it? How's that? That's um, great. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to. This is a slightly ramshackle talk because it's uh, really bringing together a range of um, different projects that I've been working on down the years. And I'm going to try and make some links to what um, Adam was just saying. Now, um, what I want to talk about today really is not so much the production of maps. Um, for publication, uh, but more about uh, my experience really in using existing digital data sets of historic mapping, the production of those uh, digital maps, and the opportunities that really come out of creating digital data sets of different kinds. And, and rather than thinking of maps as a kind of visualization of data, picking different symbologies and mapping forms and so on. I'm going to sort of give you a couple of examples of how one might use those maps in a more dynamic way, how we can use those maps to actually address specific historic questions. Um, and the experience of this really comes out of a whole number of projects that I've been involved in um, down the years. Um, and uh, such is the way with funding uh, that uh, you have to pitch ideas around specific historic questions rather than say, I want to do some mapping. So uh, the digital component has, uh, ha has really been a, a, a method uh, 
of getting at some of those specific historic questions. I'm going to introduce some of those as we go along. Um, so as we've just been hearing, there, there are a lot of pre-existing maps out there um, and recent decades in particular have seen a kind of explosion, if you like, in, uh, in the whole range of different uh, digital data sets that are available to the um, landscape historian. Um, and those are, um, you know, involve a whole range of different types of data. We've got um, data sets of historic buildings, data sets of archaeological evidences, data sets of, um, uh, uh, of portable antiquities, um, which many of which are accessible through some of those uh, gateways that um, uh, have just been introduced. And um, on top of these kind of um, national data sets. We have uh, also a number of um, particular bespoke data sets that uh, have mined uh, pre-existing data to identify specific subsets of those data. So um, looking at, for example, Anglo-Saxon um, uh, uh, burials, uh, looking at particular um, place name evidence, uh, and those can often be overlain also by um, various digitized uh, cartography. We've just heard examples. Magic is great. Gateway Canmore um, uh, in the bottom of this one has a fantastic dual view option where you can see both uh, modern day cartography alongside historic mapping um, to allow you to compare and contrast some of those um, you know, uh, longitudinal evidence that exists within these different uh, data sets. So there are lots and lots of uh, data available to you out there, uh, but it uh, introduces tricky problems and how these different data sets speak with each other um, and also how you can extract for your own purposes um, uh, specific evidence from these different data sets. So it involves a whole range of different issues uh, uh, concerned with projections, uh, data cleaning, the attribute information attached to these and so on. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. Uh, one gateway which is particularly useful uh, is Digimap. Uh, you've just heard about that. Um, uh, uh, it's uh, accessible via universities um, and is a nice gateway that has um, historic mapping, geology mapping, uh, LIDAR data, uh, all um, all available through the same portal, but MAGIC does something similar, uh, open source, so does the um, Visions of uh, Britain portal and so on. So um, uh, kind of uh, into this range of different data sets, I've, I've kind of made uh, a small foray, uh, a very small contribution to uh, the creation of these data sets um, by depositing um, digital data that have been created as part of these different projects I've been involved in um, with the archaeology data service um, uh, and um, at the moment there are only three different data sets available out there but there's another 10 or 20 or so in train um, and these is I mean, there are, there are a number of different archives of this type, but uh, these digital repositories um, are, are really built on the premise that they will archive these data and disseminate those um, for you in uh, perpetuity. So these are good repositories and an easy way really to begin to see the kinds of data that already exist out there. Um, so why bother with all this digitization? Why um, go to the trouble of turning those paper maps into uh, digital files? Well, um, you know, GIS has just been touched upon, does offer a range of um, uh, functionality which allow us to interrogate those data uh, in a number of different ways. So uh, most obviously we can ask questions about what is at a particular location and um, by recording specific data, uh, specific geospatial data, the coordinates of particular uh, uh, objects, features, sites or whatever, those can be then compared with other data sets already out there. So you might be interested in 
uh, you know, the types of elevations that objects or sites are at. You might be interested in the types of um, geologies that exist at particular locations. Does that help to inform our understanding of particular place names or particular object types or particular sites? Um, and GIS, by stacking these different layers of data on top of each other to the same spatial projection, allows us to look at those sorts of relationships that might exist between these different data sets. So on the right here, um, this is a, a, a recent project I'm working on currently, uh, which is plotting portable antiquity finds. So these are metal detected finds. Um, and their location relative to different soil types. And um, we can see clearly that there is a relationship uh, between the density of particular finds and particular soils. In red, we have picked out uh, clay soils of a particular slope. So the more slopey the clay, the more it seems it was uh, suitable to uh, agricultural activities in the past. The flatter that clay was, the more waterlogged and the less amenable it was to particular forms of settlement. We would only make those kinds of inferences by comparing these different types of data, the geology, the slope, and the distribution of objects in space. Um, GIS also allows us to display a range of different materials um, that in some other ways are, are, are kind of inaccessible. So uh, LIDAR data, this um, high resolution topographical mapping uh, is um, increasingly available uh, via the Environment Agency and other gateways. And this gives us very high resolution topographical information about slopes, about uh, the built environment and so on. Um, but is not terribly accessible in a paper map form. Um, the, the kind of benefit of LIDAR uh, is really comes in uh, from being able to throw sunlight at that terrain model uh, from low light, from different angles and so on, and thereby showing up um, a sort of slight um, shading of different, um, very minutely, uh, different um, ground surface levels. Uh, so LiDAR data uh, uh, comes into its own really in this digital environment. And those uh, digital maps then can be transformed. And uh, I see Chris is in the audience here. Thanks for this model, one of Chris's uh, three dimensional models here of a Roman fort. Um, uh, uh, by um, transforming those spatial data and uh, turning them into three-dimensional models, we are able to look at uh, the, um, uh, the, the sort of features that are perhaps not so discernible at ground level. And from these same um, uh, mappings, of course, we can draw off um, uh, data that we are interested in. So we have the example here of LIDAR data draped across an ordnance survey map, and then the paleo channels, the micro topography, of uh, now infilled um, former river courses can be traced off uh, to give us some evidence of the former uh, course of those rivers across particular landscape. And that might influence our understanding of field forms, uh, settlement um, uh, distributions and so on. And, um, uh, and this ability we've already encountered of um, comparing archeological find spots against uh, geolog geologies of different types. And those, again, might support particular um, observations about uh, preference of settlement and settlement types at different times in the past. So um, these digital data are, uh, are interesting and um, uh, uh, give us a whole range of opportunities to reconcile uh, different types of data sets through this um, lens of landscape. So on the one hand, we have the archaeological evidence, the physical remains of the past. Those could be plotted, and many of those, as we've said, are available uh, through things like the historic environment records, uh, through uh, portable antiquity scheme data sets, and so on. We have the environmental evidence that might um, uh, be uh, important 
for our understandings of human activity and landscape. And here we can draw on things like LIDAR, terrain data, uh, geolo geological data, and so on. And of course, we also have uh, a place name evidence and um, uh, sort of alongside a lot of the uh, digitization uh, projects, there have been a number of initiatives, mainly by the Institute for Name Studies in Nottingham, uh, to digitize place name evidence as part of their ongoing uh, national uh, place name um, uh, um, uh, data sets. And they're now trialing a second, um, uh, second form of their data set that provides us with place name evidence at a national scale. So we have uh, these different data sets that can be unified then through this lens of landscape uh, and uh, opens up really interesting multidisciplinary approaches that draw together these evidences from different um, kind of different different disciplines. I'll just give you a, a quick example of um, how this might work in practice um, and that is um, by drawing on um, early medieval charter bounds. So uh, these aren't maps of course but they provide mappable information. Um, charters are uh, a, a kind of rich seam of early medieval uh, written source. Um, they, uh, there's about 840 of those uh, that record the um, boundaries of estates that were granted usually by the king to the church but sometimes to um, lay beneficiaries and uh, in these charters you have an example there um, they're usually split into three segments the uh, preliminaries which describe um, the sort of value of the estate and who is the grantee and the beneficiary uh, the witness list, these charters were clearly uh, witnessed at assemblies at the bottom. And in the middle, a textual description of the estate which is being granted. And um, this usually um, uh, follows a series of landmarks perambulating the outside of a particular estate in Old English. So, um, so you have first from the hollow spring, then to, from the hollow spring until uh, the hollow way and so on uh, around the outside of this um, of this estate being granted. Now since the um, 1920s W.B. Grundy and others have uh, set about solving these charter bounds placing them into the landscape so uh, we can uh, when these are solved, have a kind of insight, if you like, of early medieval perceptions of these localities, uh, describing the heathen burials or uh, the old road, or my favourite one, uh, where the man was killed on account of the she-goat. Now, there have been digitisation uh, projects, uh, particularly by King's College, um, that have... Uh, sought to digitize the textual information contained in charter bounds. Uh, they had a project called the Electronic Sawyer which um, effectively transformed the metadata of individual um, charters into a digital and searchable database. Uh, and then they had a project called Langscape which was the uh, transcription of those charter boundaries. Uh, so it um, uh, has digitized the Old English and the glossed modern English uh, versions of those charter boundary clauses. And I've been engaged in a project uh, for the last 10 years or so, we're kind of calling Langscape 2, which is to then plot those individual charter boundaries uh, onto landscape. Um, so we have um, uh, here in green the individual landmarks that are named in these charter boundaries and in shaded grey uh, the extents of the estate that's being granted. And um, in the table at the bottom you can see some of the types of um, attribute information that we're collecting around individual landmarks. So uh, we have the Old English, we have the modern glosses, uh, but then we have a range of um, additional uh, sources that allow you to track back to where that information came from. So the charter numbers, uh, the position within that charter, but also uh, information about the types of landmarks that might be recorded. So whether they are uh, generics, 
for waterways or whether they are particular places or the types of landscape that they might be describing. Now by coding those landmarks in such a way we're able to mine those data to get a kind of broader picture of the landscape. So um, you probably can't make out the legend in this but we have um, different types of water features for example or different types of um, hills or different types of land use. Um, different types of settlement or personal names. So by coding these charter boundaries, by coding the data um, that exists in textual sources, we can plot those out and start to have something of a picture of what that early medieval landscape looked like. So by creating new data sets from this cartography, we actually can begin to think about some other uh, we might say more interesting things. We can reconstruct the early medieval landscape. We can think about what do those early medieval places refer to by comparing it, for example, against the archeological evidence or against the geological evidence. Can we get insights into early medieval uses of the landscape or perhaps even in the case of personal names about early medieval perceptions of the landscape? Why are they calling that particular hill Covers Hill, the old Anglo-Saxon King Cover, West Saxon King. Uh, and of course we can think about um, reconciling some of the slightly cryptic information that's contained in individual data sets. And this is really where multidisciplinary research comes to the fore, in that one might have a place named Scholar who's looked at the Old English element ditch, uh, which means ditch or dike. Um, and, you know, um, a place named dictionary will say whenever we see the word ditch, it means ditch or dike. But by plotting those in landscape, by ground truthing them, by looking at the relationship between those place name elements and other archaeological elements, you know, in some cases, could ditch actually refer to a Roman road? Are there nuances in place name, uh, um, place name, uh, place names given to um, particular locations that help us to understand much better uh, the early medieval perceptions of these particular landscapes and that of course feeds back into place name studies by helping us to refine our understanding of particular elements. So one goes from place names to landscape and then back into place names again. And of course um, we also have this ability to track um, the um, sort of development of land holding across the early medieval landscape. So uh, particularly in places with uh, many of these early medieval charters, we can look at uh, the establishment of particular states, uh, their subdivision, their fission or their fusion um, uh, over uh, later uh, periods. And that gives us insights, of course, into land holding um, uh, and the land holders themselves through time. So um, this uh, sort of data um, allows us to interrogate some of the spatial patterns that we see in some, uh, in some detail. Um, but there is a, a, another value to this kind of plotting in that um, it, it, it helps us to rethink, like in the example of those charter boundary marks, um, what we understand of particular places. Um, and this comes out of ground truthing that data, looking at those elements in landscape, looking at the assemblage of archaeological, topographical, uh, geological information together. Um, so we have an example here of um, place name Moot Hill um, uh, signed to this particular um, uh, 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 field or strip in the tithe map and uh, Moot of course uh, uh, an early uh, medieval Old English uh, term for assemblies and in this case we can identify that particular assembly um, location uh, uh, with some precision 
but by ground truthing, by um, looking at the topographical character of those individual places, it gives us some insights into why that location was chosen for a moot or why was a particular location chosen for any form of uh, early uh, activity. And this kind of brings together not just the cartographic information, but also aspects of uh, of the phenomenological, the experience of particular locations. This location is picked because it has these vast views across the Dorset countryside, so that um, in all likelihood the assemblies that are taking place here are in plain sight of those assembled and um, adds to the kind of rhetoric of um, performance that takes place at particular assemblies in the early medieval period. And that same kind of ground truthing um, I've applied um, in a project uh, looking at the archaeology of the Thames foreshore. So um, the uh, Thames um, discovery program now uh, rolled into Citizen has um, attempted to plot the archaeological evidence uh, exposed at low tide along the Thames and now around the coasts of England. And it's by plotting that evidence, but also um, ground truthing it, looking at the locations relative to uh, existing buildings, relative to changes in the tide and so on, that we get greater understanding of what those features uh, may have been and how they were used in the past. So it adds to our understanding of particular locations. Um, and this kind of um, digital data uh, can also be used um, to start thinking about change through time. And this is really um, one of the uh, uh, things that I've been looking at most recently in a number of different projects is to try and understand um, how um, the past influences the present and how um, how we might chart those changes as we move through time. Um, so here's an example of um, the national um, transport infrastructure, as far as we understand it, uh, from Roman times uh, through the medieval period. And in collaboration with colleagues in Cambridge, the CAMPOP project, uh, looking at the early modern and modern landscape. And, um, uh, and the interesting thing about this, um, this form of plotting, this uh, longitudinal evidence that's contained in these digital data is that we can look at the um, total percentage of survival from Roman times into uh, the present day. So we can look at, well, why do Roman roads survive in particular regions and not in others? Um, what sorts of qualities of those roads or are there particular qualities of the of those roads that might um, uh, make them more usable or less usable as we move through time and the types of roads today uh, that originated at different times in the past now um, uh, once uh, one has done that kind of very basic mapping it opens up other forms of uh, modeling uh, and this is um, just a, a few different examples that look at transport uh, geography as a way of thinking about how that has influenced, um, uh, you know, human behaviour, economic behaviour, uh, uh, military behaviour at different points in the past. So um, one can take a transport network and apply different techniques of network analysis to look at um, how well particular places are linked to others, uh, how poorly certain places are linked to each other, uh, and in a sense give a, a, a model of those best connected or least connected places in the English landscape, or British landscape in some of these slides. And those of course can then be compared with um, uh, the political, urban history, economic history um, that, uh, can, that can be read off those different connections or compared with those different connected uh, network plots. Uh, so we have an example here of, uh, of the Roman uh, exotic imports, those uh, foreign goods and how those are dispersed across Roman Britain um, and how those might be um, influenced by the 
uh, level of connectivity between different places and on the right you've got a, a, an example of uh, looking at the urban trajectory across the medieval period and how those might be influenced by the degrees of connectivity in, in transportation terms. Um, we could also of course think about transport geography in terms of terrain um, and GIS allows us to think about um, you know, degrees of slope, uh, the uh, ease of traversability across different forms of landscape. Uh, so these are just two different models here looking at um, a, a terrain map uh, of, of connectivity across England and Wales. Uh, the white filaments of the most easily traversed, least cost paths across this landscape, the black ones are the most difficult uh, um, uh, uh, terrains to traverse. So we can see from this kind of plotting already the natural corridors of movement and connection uh, that exist simply by virtue of slope uh, of the grain of the landscape. And we might relate that uh, on the right hand side to the survival or not of particular um, Roman roads or other route ways through this landscape. And many of those Roman roads that do survive are the ones that cut across the grain. They provide a way of um, traversing those difficult landscapes. Where they don't survive tends to be in those areas where natural gradient already um, corrals movement uh, through particular corridors. Um, networks of course can be interrogated not just for the ways in which they connect places but also one can extract additional information uh, from those so we might think a little bit about um, uh, uh, the sort of um, degrees to which road intersections for example might uh, give us insights to the level or the density of settlement um, in in space uh, so here's just uh, one technique uh, just to run you through that quickly this is called uh, percolation analysis uh, which looks at so here we've extracted all of the intersections in the uh, in the British Isles that are uh, contained in the modern road network and by percolating them by looking at the density of those individual intersections these can be mathematically grouped together into uh, in, into those clusters of uh, most connected or most dense points. So we start off with a super group, everywhere is connected, but as we dig down into those data, we see that there are specific clusters of intersections. And this technique could be used uh, to look at the density of settlement, it could be looked at density of archaeological objects, it could be used to think about place names and so on, to look at those um, small areas of most densely connected places. And uh, this kind of percolation, of course, if you stopped that script at any point, uh, might show areas that at some point in the past were connected in particular ways. And what's interesting when we look at uh, these kinds of percolation models and compare those with other data sets, like, for example, um, per capita income or house prices is that the connectivities in transport network do seem to correlate well uh, with particular other indicators of uh, wealth or um, uh, population density across the nation as a whole. So there is a grain, a structural geographical um, underpinning to some of the um, inequalities that we see in the contemporary landscape. I'll just give you um, one quick uh, further example. This is a project um, I'm working on at the moment, which is thinking about how one might um, uh, um, look at the evolution of the administrative geography. Um, and the starting point for this um, project is Doomsday Book. Of course, this uh, fantastic um, source put together in the late 11th century on the orders of uh, King William and provides us in many cases with the earliest information about um, particular um, places in the English and part of Welsh uh, landscape. 
Now, the interesting thing about Doomsday Book, as you know, is that it's um, part of the way in which it's compiled and certainly the way in which it's been transcribed and turned into a volume is to subdivide it into particular administrative districts. So you have shires, uh, the largest groupings making up individual folios, and those themselves are then split into entries under individual hundreds, so subdivisions of the shire. So most of the entries in Doomsday Book will follow this format. In this hundred, such and such held this land, this land, this land, and this land. So, uh, of course, that's interesting and has been used by um, historians from Maitland onwards for over 100 years as, as uh, providing us with really interesting information about population, about economy, about uh, settlement forms and so on across the English landscape. Um, but in uh, my case, I was interested in how one might use this data to think about the administrative geography uh, that existed. So we have um, individual vills and the holdings of in individual vills listed under hundreds, the subdivisions of the shire or in parts of the Dane law. Uh, these are uh, synonymous with wapentakes. And um, we have other sources that collaborate the information in Doomsday Book 100 Ordnance from the reign of King Edgar, which tells us about the functions of the 100. They are places really about local policing. They are places in which taxes collected. They're uh, essentially the communities of the 10th and 11th centuries. Hundreds are not plotted in Doomsday Book. Um, and here we rely really on um, you know, many decades of historians' work that has attempted to reconstruct the hundreds um, as they are described in Doomsday Book. And the way um, most have gone about that is to plot all of the individual vills um, uh, uh, that are listed under particular hundreds and then looking at the parish boundaries of those vills um, and in a sense agglomerating those together to define the limits of, uh, of the hundreds. So they're not precise, um, but they can be, um, in some cases where of Anglo-Saxon charter boundaries, be reconciled with um, 10th uh, or in some cases earlier boundary information. So we've got good grounds for believing that these plots that have been modelled on the basis of Doomsday Book um, bear some relationship to the administrative divisions as they exist in the 11th century. Now in order to do this I've um, drawn on um, parish uh, data, digital pre-existing parish data. Um, you mentioned uh, the Cane and Oliver um, parish um, digitization earlier. Uh, there is actually a better available data set which uh, cleaned and improved on Kane and Oliver by Campop. Um, so we have the 19th century digitized data. Those were then agglomerated together to form particular hundreds. Uh, in fact, could also be compared with the 19th century hundreds, which have also been digitized, uh, the Anglo-Saxon charter information that I've already mentioned. So um, the resulting data set uh, that were produced uh, from this digitization uh, really falls into two different types of data. On the one hand, we have uh, the individual meeting places. Most hundreds are named after the, uh, the meeting place where the hundred assembled. So individual places in landscape and those are appropriate to sort of detailed thick descriptions that describe terrain, topography, the archaeological signature of those places and so on. And on the other hand, this, this, this plotting of the administrative districts themselves, the territorial data, if you like. Uh, and both of those different data sets um, uh, can um, be analysed using different types of techniques. I'll just look at um, the territorial data, mainly because that is already available to you via um, this um, ADS website I've already mentioned. So you can see there are doomsday shires and hundreds of England. You can download these and play with them to your heart's content. It looks something like this. Um, so these are the 800 or so um, hundreds that are um, 
solvable from the doomsday evidence. Uh, in yellow, um, in the case of East Anglia, those are solved from the little doomsday. In the north of England, they're solved uh, from later medieval sources. The north is not recorded in doomsday books. So we've got uh, the main area in blue, uh, which um, comprises the main data set. And what's uh, really useful when we plot um, the administrative districts of the country in this way is that you can instantly see that hundreds meant different things in different parts of the country. So uh, they range massively in size. We have some areas where incredibly complex interdigitation of uh, different hundreds takes place. We have areas compare, for example, Surrey, where you've got this great regular line of hundreds laid out, uh, sort of similarly sized and very regular in form along, uh, um, along the North Downs. Um, and compare that then with somewhere like, for example, Worcestershire, where we have this massive irregularity of hundreds and so on. So there's clearly different things going on here and, um, and sort of the book I'm writing at the moment is, is talking about what some of those differences are. So um, I can't summarise an entire book, but I'll just um, talk about a couple of things very rapidly. One is that those hundreds, of course, have names. Uh, so we can think about those different naming practices and whether there is uh, some historical reason why those uh, names are applied. So here are the names that are hundreds that are named after groups, uh, community names, things like Ingas, which means the followers of, or, or Ware, Old English Ware, a community name. So um, most hundreds, it would seem, aren't named from early groups, early communities, folk groups, if you want to use that term most would seem to be named from something else. But that then raises the question, well, why are particular areas named from individual groups? Is there a historical reason for that? So there's questions we might ask about that. Then there's this issue about regularity and irregularity. And certainly when we dig down into the spatial pattern of individual hundreds, we can see that in certain areas there is great regularity to these hundreds themselves. And the archetype for this is Huntingdonshire. Uh, so if we look at Huntingdonshire, it's, it's um, you know, forms a fairly regular uh, coherent shape. And Huntingdonshire is split into four different parts, each of which forms a kind of pie slice, if you like, from Huntingdon, um, um, split into these four different quarters. Each of these quarters takes its name from a distinctive stone uh, which formed the meeting place of that hundred. Each of those stones is laid out on a Roman road that leads into Huntingdon. And each of these hundreds, each of these four quarters of Huntingdonshire is valued in Doomsday Book at 200 hides, the unit of assessment at the time. So the whole thing gives us a um, sense really that this shire and the hundreds that um, composed this shire were laid out at a single moment to a similar blueprint at a single moment of administrative uh, organization. A reshiring, it's sometimes called, um, that we see particularly across the Midland parts of England. Um, we can see this very similar layout of quartered hundreds, um, each of quarter being made up of multiple hundreds in other shires. Leicestershire looks very similar. Cambridgeshire, a certain part of Cambridgeshire looks very similar. Southern part of Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire and so on. So we can see um, simply by plotting out these data, um, a, a kind of um, explanatory model for the administration or the laying out of a West Saxon administration across the Southern Midlands. So cartography allows us to write a story of development across the 10th and 11th centuries in this region, something I've tried to do in this article. Now, of course, we could think about 100 um, regularity and irregularity also in fiscal terms, we can add up the values in Doomsday Book and look at um, how closely each of these hundreds actually do uh, equal a hundred hides. Um, and East Kent, obviously nothing looks anywhere, uh, I should say in yellow, doesn't seem to be any correspondence whatsoever with multiples of a hundred, those in red and brown uh, within 5% or so of 100 hides or multiples thereof. So there are 
uh, areas where we can see great irregularity in the fiscal values of, of individual hundreds and areas with a very great regularity in the fiscal hundreds. I'm speeding up quickly. Um, these evidences can be used together to um, really start thinking about local landscape history in a much more detailed way. So uh, I'll just give you a quick example here in uh, Norfolk. Uh, we can use this model of regularity and irregularity. So in, uh, in, in, in purple, we have the more irregular ones. In brown, we have more regular. I won't go into how those regularities and irregularities are defined. And we can look at the boundaries of individual hundreds uh, to see whether they can be grouped together, a la Huntingdonshire. Here's the example of uh, Caister by Norwich. And uh, when we pull out the 300s around Caister, we can see um, the sort of uh, a grouping of 300s that seem to have uh, a, a share, a kind of spatial um, form in that most of the external boundaries form T-junctions. So those sort of T-junction edges might be indicative of, of partition of some earlier larger territory and it has a kind of spatial coherence itself. Um, that, when we plot it against our geo, uh, geological information here, um, is clearly shown to be a, a kind of river valley uh, territory, um, which the outside edges of which uh, correlate closely with the watershed boundaries between individual uh, waterways. So there's good topographical grounds for thinking these 300s are formally forming a coherent territory. Um, this can then be combined with uh, soil maps uh, and again we can see along that river valley of the greatest uh, in grey, the most amenable, easily worked soils, more difficult soils as we move towards the edges of that territory. We can populate uh, that landscape with evidence for woodland uh, in the form of parks, um, 19th century deer parks, um, uh, woods preserved in a magic data set, um, um, uh, commons, uh, these sorts of things that can be plotted from the 19th century. And again, we can see that most of those clutter near the, cluster near the external limits of this putative territory. And we can compare it with the doomsday evidence for woodland. So this is a, um, 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 this is a, a, a model of the density of woodland as it appears in, in, in or as, as it's recorded in Doomsday Book. So in dark filaments, we can see the most heavily wooded regions in white, the most open regions. And that area picked out in green corresponds with our Caister um, territory. So we have these different data sets, which together seem to provide us evidence with an early territorial entity, an early group that has um, a, territorial coherence has a um, coherent in terms of its terrain, it has a coherence in terms of its soils and landscape. And that can be replicated elsewhere across um, East Anglia and here those putative territories uh, can also correspond with those places containing people name, Ingas, so Blithing, Clavering, Erping um, and so on. So here we have territorial entities already named in uh, Old English as groups of people. So have we got here some kind of deep structure for territorial organization preserved in Doomsday Book but dating back to some point before Doomsday Book. And when we compare those with archaeological evidence, we can see that many of those cluster around or seem to be focused on uh, Romano-British um, settlements of different kinds. So have we got something which actually goes back into the Roman times, uh, uh, influencing later settlement development and so on? So this kind of map regression allows us to think back through the landscape evidence to the deep structures that are preserved in data sets like, for example, the doomsday evidence. So what are some lessons to take away from all this? Well, um, there are many GIS tasks, uh, many digitization tasks that we need to uh, be conscious of. Um, obviously, the functionality of GIS allows us to create those maps, to create those three-dimensional views, to um, look at the data in interesting and different ways. Um, but that is 
um, really, uh, and indeed, I've, I've given some examples of the ways in which one might analyze these different data sets. But all of that depends very much on thinking carefully about the way in which that data is put together and, um, uh, uh, and the way in which that data is structured. And uh, just some, I could go on about this at some length, but some very quick lessons that uh, we need to be conscious of before you start any type of mapping project. Uh, the first one, most obvious one is, is spatial referencing. GIS, um, um, many of these things that we've looked at depend on those um, data being projected to the same spatial um, referencing system. Um, so uh, this is this is of course well known that we can use different forms of latitude and longitude. Uh, if your data is set up to those different spatial references systems, it can be difficult to plot those directly on top of each other. Anybody who's monkeyed around with Google Maps and then tried to compare them with Ordnance Survey Maps will know what I mean. Is that those two different reference spatial referencing systems sometimes don't speak very easily. Uh, with each other. So be conscious that the data that you might be pulling off the web, the data that you're producing them yourself may not come in the same projection and they may need to do some transformations to make those sit perfectly on top of each other. Check what data already exists. The example that we looked at um, of this um, uh, road network um, study that I've been doing is only possible because each of those road segments is mapped exactly on top of each other. <laughs> and the only reason that we were able to do that is because right from the outset of the project, um, CAMPOP, uh, the UCL team, and Didina Digimap were speaking with each other to make sure that we are using the same, um, same underlying data sets and using those uh, in the same sorts of ways. So we established amongst ourselves conventions that we will all be using in these sorts of projects. And what that looks like on the ground means that if you overlay different roads of different periods on top of each other, that they are snapped exactly on top of each other. Every single node in every single segment lies on top of um, uh, the corresponding data sets, the other corresponding spatial data set. And the more um, you um, pull data off the web, the more you use uh, other data sets, the more you'll be aware that most of those do not map exactly onto each other. So those percentages of preservation, continuity and so on were only possible because in this case, all of those data sets marry up absolutely precisely with each other. So think about what already exists out there and talk to those data producers if you're going to create data yourself to see how best your data can fit in with what already is out there. Um, this is a particular issue and um, we've mentioned tithe maps uh, already. Um, uh, tithe maps are uh, incredibly useful, incredibly detailed uh, evidence of landscape, um, but you may find uh, that um, you know certain areas have been digitized uh, but neighboring ones haven't so um, this was a problem I encountered doing some type map digitization in South Oxfordshire we digitized uh, the type maps for 16 adjacent parishes and I made the mistake of digitizing those separately and then trying to join them <laughs> and of course one finds that those joins don't match up much better is to use pre-existing data and build on that using things like autocomplete functions and so on. Don't simplify the lines, make sure that nodes, vertices in your polygonized data sets sit on top of each other. And think about what you're going to label those um, data that you produce with, what we call attributes. Um, attributes are what allow us to do things um, like the charter boundary um, landscape digitization reconstruction that I spoke about earlier. In this case, uh, those tithe maps have been compared with estate maps, which of course aren't, um, as we've heard, aren't um, drawn in quite the same detail. But by having the base map of tithe maps, we can then compare that with the uh, landscape preserved in estate maps. <coughs> 
to pull out uh, open fields, um, closes, headlands, and so on, uh, that um, contained within that tide map data. So think about the attributes. Um, as far as attributes are concerned, make sure that if you start coding up labeling individual data sets, make sure that you stick to pre-existing standards. And it may be that you're interested in you know, particular types of um, land form or particular types of archaeological evidence. Uh, there are um, uh, various consortia that have been um, trying to identify the best terminologies for all sorts of things. Um, how we, um, what we call particular types of geologies, what we call particular types of archaeological monument, what we call particular types of archaeological uh, objects and so on. So there are vocabularies, controlled terminologies that may exist out there. And if you're going to start labeling up your maps, make sure that you stick to those vocabularies because that's going to make future interoperability between these data sets much, much easier. Don't start making up your own names. Um, and that applies really to metadata more broadly, so not just the attributes of individual features, objects that you're drawing, um, but it applies also to the ways in which you describe your data, the ways in which you record the metadata, the information about those data sets that you're producing. And again, there are a whole range of lists of metadata conventions which it is good to think about when you're starting to produce and while you're producing those data. It's a terrible thing to try and do at the end. Don't be sloppy with metadata. Think about it as part of your project design. And then there's this issue of cleaning. And cleaning is a nightmare. Um, so, uh, and by data cleaning, I mean this issue about how your data uh, marries up against each other spatially, how the information about individual uh, objects, features that you're recording uh, are, are attributed, and make sure that you stick to controlled uh, terminologies and make sure that your um, drawn features map as precisely as possible against each other. So with this tithe map digitization, you can see some of the errors that have crapped in here between these three different adjacent uh, tithe maps. Those individual strips should, in theory, of course, um, completely map up against each other. But we have, because I was drawing those separately rather than uh, at the same time, um, created all sorts of gaps and errors in those data that then need to go back and be fixed. So you can spend three times as long cleaning data as producing it in the first place. So it's good to have a strategy for cleaning uh, already from the outset. Anyway, that's uh, all a bit of a rush at the end. Uh, some acknowledgements there of collaborators and data producers. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, Stuart. That's, uh, that was really, uh, really interesting. Um, I have a little bit of time for questions, not too many. Um, or oh, someone's found the clap icon, excellent. Um, so um, if you'd like to ask questions, I'm happy to appear on screen. There is a hand raising function um, for those familiar with Zoom, which I think, according to a quick look at the uh, help being Alt plus Y on your keyboard or uh, your operating Windows machine, or Alt plus Options plus Y on a Mac will get you. I'm failing that, it's in, the, it's in the control somewhere. If not, then please put something in the chat. Um, before we go any further, though, um, I'd just like to uh, remind everybody that um, the VCH has an app um, which is available via AMA Media. It's a free app, um, which I've just put, I'm just about to put the link in the chat, um, which um, ties together all the first edition ordnance survey mapping and uh, can be, if for a small fee, um, plummet into the VCH descriptions while, while you're out and about. You can take your mobile device and while you're walking around the place, you can have a look at what the ordnance survey mapping shows you for the, for the place you're standing in, um, which is great if you want to do that ground truth thing, um, thing that Stuart was talking about. So, any questions? Yes. I'll just unmute you. Oops. Ah. I'll just unmute you, Elaine. Off you go. 
Sorry, I wasn't asking a question. Oh, yeah, you know, there's a hand up. Sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Are there, so are, do we have any questions at all? Um, yes, uh, certainly we possibly have a list of uh, the links mentioned in the talk. Um, um, when we upload the um, the present the uh, the recording onto the events archive, the links will be in there. But what I will do is um, take the links from my presentation and from Stuart's presentation and put them in a document with that, um, which will upload to the website at the same time. Of some of the ones that have come up in the chat as well, where there's dozens of interesting things I don't know about anymore. Uh, yes. Uh, Hi, um, I'm sorry, English is not my uh, first language, and I'm sorry for the accent. But uh, to collaborate on that, I didn't quite catch the meaning of the word tithes, and I don't want to go on the internet and get misinformed. So sure. please. Go um, somebody put in the uh, in the chat function. They put a, a link to the National Archives uh, description of it, which is more thorough than we can give now. Um, but fundamentally, a tithe is a tenth of the crops given for the maintenance of the parish clergy. Simple as that, really, um, okay. which uh, would have been in the form of corn, grain, sheep, first lambs or whatever. And by the 19th century was gradually sort of commuted to cash. But by that, it was formally changed into a cash sum due from the people who lived in the place. So Thank help. you. No problem. Got time for a couple more? I think this one for Stuart here, which is uh, Des Atkinson. Uh, it's what kind of tools are available for people uh, to create edit maps for their own projects? Um, do people take PDF files and edit them with tools such as Preview on Mac OS? Um, well, I've pointed to some of these things that some of our authors have done creatively, but I'm sure that, I'm sure Stuart's got some um, more technical ideas. Yes, clergymen. Yes, thank you. Um, clergymen. Yes, it's Church of England clergy, not Roman Catholic or Nonconformist. Of course, although of course tithes originate before the Reformation. So, yeah. But going back to Des's question about um, what sort of tools available to create and edit maps, Stuart, perhaps you'd like to. Um, so it depends, really. If you're if if you're just producing um, a, a sort of digital version of paper maps, I tend to use um, drawing software like uh, Adobe Illustrator and so on. Um, with digital data and GIS data sets of the type that I was just talking about, uh, QGIS is probably the easiest um, open source GIS data set. Um, it's reasonably easy to at least load data sets up and look at those. Um, although some of the more detailed modeling tools and so on require a bit of, is a, a slightly more steeper learning curve. Yeah. <coughs> but, um, but at least for projecting data sets, QGIS is what I'd recommend. Mm. Okay. And um, I should say that the IHR um, run a variety of training courses and GIS is one of those. Um, which is worth looking into. Well, I'm not quite sure how they're running at the moment with the COVID issues, but uh, there are um, there are other training available. Um, got time for one more, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, there is also there is still always tracing paper or tracing film. Alex is uh, a good point from Alex Grove. Um, that is the old-fashioned way of getting maps, but uh, it works. And um, if the archive, if you're using archival maps, do ask first, mm. however. Um, yeah, I mean, with, with our tithe map digitization, we tried a number of different things. And obviously, again, this is an issue really of what the archives allow you to do. Mm. But um, uh, photographing and then georeferencing photographs is 
one method and mm. it's useful for picking out certain elements in tithe maps but actually tracing tithe maps and then scanning the tracings and digitizing from that is actually the most efficient way um, to yeah. turn to turn tithe maps into digital data sets so so even though i've been talking about digital stuff there is still an element of tracing involved yeah uh, and it should be said that any sort of any process of this sort is an interpretive process you know you're describing what you can see on the page um, and I, I actually, I still have tracings done for my MA <laughs> of maps done in that thing, precisely that form, because that was the most convenient way to do it. Um, okay, at that point, I think uh, we should probably say thank you to Stuart and thank you to everybody for attending. It's been really, really appreciated for your time. Um, there will be uh, an option to give feedback on this session and indeed any of the other sessions. Um, and Gemma will send that out with uh, after uh, Gemma Dormer, our events uh, coordinator, will send that after the session. So um, thank you to everybody for your time and thank you for coming. And I hope you've learned some. I heard, hope you've learned uh, something. And if there's any questions you occur to you after we've after the session's ended, then I'm sure Stuart would be happy to receive your emails. I certainly would be. Um, and you can get hold of me, you can get hold of me, uh, say by email, which is adam.chapman at sas.ac.uk. Okay, so thank you very much. Thanks. Goodbye.